let's start let's start with the group that did the college classroom. What were some ideas that you had? Um, you said like for you know final projects or any type of um, assignment or activity that we have yeah, that the, the students can use any format that they want for the best that they can. So say someone um, you know wants to do a skit that's very theatrical and that's the best way that they can communicate what they have learned or if someone wants to do it in an essay and maybe that's their way of expressing or communicating their ideas so that um, you know there's a rubric and they meet all those expectations still but they do it in a variety of ways. Absolutely. And I like that you all talked about the rubric because there still has to be criteria. Everybody who does it has to meet that criteria but you can meet that criteria with a skit or a brochure or a movie or a video or, or anything that you are good at doing. So great. Um, we thought of, we just because um, a few of us here at the table are history majors, and we were thinking about in history classes, a lot of times you give a lesson or a unit, you're studying that lesson or unit, and then you have the assessment at the end. And we thought based upon a rubric, we could do where part of it might be a written assignment, the other part might be an oral portion, and then maybe they could do a fun activity like a comic strip or, you know, something tactile where they could make a model, whatever they wanted to do. But what it does is it gives that student that maybe they're not a great writer, but they're much better verbally conveying what they know and their thoughts. And if everybody's doing the same thing, I as a teacher, because I've dealt with these students, will know I know the student's probably a better writer than a speaker because they might be a little more shy. But at the same time, it gives them three different avenues to convey the same information that hopefully everybody's learning. And it doesn't mean that I weigh one part heavier than the other. It just means I need to make sure that what's required, what I taught, has been learned from that student. And it gives them three shots at the same opportunity to prove that they got it. Good. And thinking about that diversity in our learners. And you make a great point, you know, if, if we're studying history and the standards, give me a history standard that you would evaluate. Well, we definitely have to learn like the Reconstruction period. Okay. That part. So you're learning about the Reconstruction period. And you ask students to say, a, a typical assignment might be to write an essay about the Reconstruction period. If the child knows everything about it, they're really good at it, but they're not a great writer, what are you measuring with that assessment? their ability to, uh, their knowledge of the content standard or their ability to write. And that, and you made a good point. If we, if we, we're not getting, it's not, not only is it not a fair assessment, it's not an accurate assessment because I'm not walking away as a teacher knowing what that student knows about the reconstruction period. I'm walking away looking at the student's writing ability. Is that a problem with the student or the curriculum or the assessment that we've developed? That, that's, in UDL we talk about barriers, and to me that's a barrier because that has put a, a barrier in front of that student where that student's not able to show us what they know. Um, same as in the college classroom, if, if professors keep giving you multiple choice tests and that's not the way that you perform best, and uh, you know, it always happens. You take the test, you walk out, you can say everything to me, um, but when it gets to sitting down and filling it out, you can't. That's not a, a problem within our children or our students, that is a problem within our curriculum. That's a barrier that is in that curriculum. And Universal Design for Learning seeks to remove those barriers by providing choices like you were talking about or options like you all were talking about. Any other thoughts or ideas? I, I, I wanted to mention something about the professors from the professor's standpoint. One of the things you can keep in our supplement is I think it's real important to remember to put the students in your class in different types of uh, action situations or engagement situations mm -hmm. or even asking them questions. For example, I have seen some of my old students they're asking me questions that produce anxiety, right? <laughs> and explaining it to them after you do it. So that, that's <laughs> one way to do it. But if I, ask, if I ask you if you know the answer to raise your hand, so, you know, those simple kind of things, we're making sure they're in groups and different size groups, because different size groups will be the different results, mm -hmm. and then explain that to them. And then have had them do oral presentations with a rubric, and have them walk through that and work it out. So I think as a college professor, my focus, I think, is to put them in a variety of situations to give them the tools. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And modeling what we want them to be able to do. Okay. Did you have something? Only the, the uh, history example. But I remember when I was in middle school and I was working with some students and this one boy was very, he just wanted to do well so badly but he had difficulty writing and, and remembering everything, particularly in social studies. And I saw him one day and he said, I'm so excited. We're going to have a test on Friday. I think I'm going to ace it. Really, that's great. What he said, this is states and the capitals. And I had to remember, I memorized it in fifth grade, so I don't have to learn a whole lot about it, but I think I can get it and I think I'll, I'm going to know it. He was like so pumped that he was going to get 100 on this test. 
Well, then I saw him a couple days later. He actually found me when I was on bus duty, and like you know, <laughs> and he was like, his, he like really upset. And I said, "What's wrong?" And he said, "I'm going to fail that test." And I said, well, "Wait a minute! You just were going to get an ace. You know, you're an ace a couple of days ago." He said, "The teacher said that spelling counts." Mm -hmm. So here was this. What's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with it? Is it fair? No. Is it accurate? No. So I even went to the teacher and said, maybe he could, he's a really bad speller, but he really tried. Could he like write down how he thinks it's spelled so you know what he was intending? And maybe go to an atlas and then copy it the right way. Nope, couldn't do that. It wouldn't be fair. Mm -hmm. So I think the point here is we have to make sure that we're really, as we're all saying, make sure that when we, we ask for a product, that we're really, it's valid in what it is that we want to know. Do they want to know the states or capitals, or do they want to know 100 now spelling words that this child has? I have a question. Um, understanding that we're all also writing and reading teachers, how do we um, help the students understand their weaknesses without discouraging them from what they're good at? Like being realistic about the fact that they can't write or can't spell without destroying them. You bring up a great point because we are all teachers of reading and writing, absolutely. Um, and so it's not that we don't give them opportunities to practice that, but we're selective about when are we evaluating them. Um, if it's you know if if it's a spelling test, then by all means spelling counts, then that's what we're going to focus on there. Um, but if it's social studies and it's about the capitals and the states, then we evaluate it there. So it's being purposeful about you know we have to evaluate students on all kinds of areas and on all the standards, but thinking about what am I really evaluating here, um, and that's a hard thing to do even for college professors, because we think everything we say and teach is very important, it's critical information, <laughs> and you better have it when you walk out of our classroom. But you have to kind of, we have to kind of step back and say, what, what is the big idea and the critical information and during understanding of this particular activity lesson that I'm trying to accomplish? Um, and then I'm going to take and make sure that I cover all my bases and cover that writing. Even though we're going to practice writing, we'll do activities, but they're not threatening in that they're not going to count against that student and, and grading or assessment of things in this context, but it might do it in another context. So we're giving kind of brief examples, but absolutely, you want to be sure that you have a lot of balance and, uh, and cover a lot of ground um, in your instructional practices. Right, and I was just saying, making sure that we teach them, because if we're in a math class and we want them to write how they, they got to an answer, we have to teach them to write that in that format, in that way. We're in a science class, and we want them to write about the result of, hy of a hypothesis. Again, that's a little bit different writing stuff. So if we teach it, we model it. Somebody, you were saying, model the art project before they do it. So if we teach it, we model it, we give them supports and, and scaffold it, and then expect them to do it. Um, and they're going to be on different levels. Again, that's the that's the you know the 21st century classes are are diverse classrooms. Some students aren't going to need that direct instruction. They already know how to write like a, ma a mathematician or a scientist, but other kids will. So if we just build that in, and our expectations are there, but we're constantly raising the bar, but making it doable for them, that's the key. Good point. Yeah. We're going to move into the last one very quickly. Getting on the slide. <laughs> What emotion comes to mind when you see that book? Excitement. Excitement? Yeah. Square. Times Square. Happy? Excited? Anybody not happy or excited? Me. <laughs> not much anybody else. <laughs> anybody else? Vibrant. Vibrant. Busy. Mugger. <laughs> not an emotion. <laughs> She's modeling very well the fact that what I mean, I love. I mean, we were, and when we were talking about this, I love New York City. She's like, uh uh. <laughs> Did it once, no. <laughs> um, she even said this photo kind of even made her think she might like it again, but not really. <laughs> it was a phantom picture. Yeah, it's a phantom picture. But th the point behind this slide is we will use things with our kids and we'll say, everybody is going to love New York City. No doubt about it. I just lost one student over there because the first thing that came to her mind is, uh uh, I do not like it. There is traffic, there are muggers, there are, there are no horses. Um, <laughs> and so, uh uh, it's, I'm checked out. It's not my <laughs> um, We'll use sometimes a picture of Disney World. You would think, who in their right mind wouldn't love Mickey Mouse and Disney World? There are a lot of people who don't like Mickey 
Disney World. So the point, though, being don't ever make assumptions and assume that what you're using to engage your students, to draw them in, your, your hook, your um, anticipatory set, whatever you want to call it, whatever you're doing to kind of bring them into that lesson and then sustain their effort throughout the lesson, don't make any assumptions about the fact that what's engaging to you and to 95% of your students is going to be engaging to 100% of your students. So by being flexible and offering choices in the way that we engage our learners, we make sure that we don't lose the one, two, three people who don't like New York City or who aren't engaged um, or excited about Disney World or whatever that case may be. Um, so if we go to that other, our multiple means of engagement. How many of you like to have some choices, some input into the work that you do? Good. So do your students. They like to have a choice. They like to have some options. Um, I went in, my son was doing an art project one time, and I did the, the good thing and volunteered. I didn't realize they were doing the Mother's Day presents, though, so <laughs> the teacher was very upset that I was in there volunteering during the Mother's Day thing. But anyway, I saw there was a helper going around, and the students were cutting things out and pasting the hands. It was one of those poems, my handprint. And I noticed that the, she was going around, she's like, no, 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 it's got to go on this side, this direction, it's got to look like this. And I mm -hmm. thought, what mother's going to care if the hand's upside down or inside? And that's going to tell me about my learner, my child. And those kids were not having a good time making these cards because they were being pressured to make the cards all look the same. Um, and they lost the whole purpose of the activity, which is to create something fun for your parent, for your mom. Um, and so that always stuck in my mind as a great example of how you lose kids in what should be a really fun activity by restricting it. So allowing choice, allowing autonomy, allow them to think outside of the box. If you give your students opportunities to, to come up with things, both for action and expression and for engagement, they will blow your mind every time. They will come up with something that is way beyond your wildest imagination. Um, it will be fantastic work. Um, they will impress you beyond belief. Um, and so when we think about um, engagement, but think about keeping those kids engaged. Think about ways that you can do that. We're going to move on because we only have a few minutes. But um, you, so, you, know, we'll you want to see the handout? The yes, there is a handout, um, the college handout. This is for our um, college professors. Um, we're for our students to give to college to give professors. <laughs> <laughs> our names are not on them, right? That's no. right. No. <laughs> this is you what the links out. are, though, um, on that last page. Yes, it, there are links on the very back. Um, and, you know, it's funny. Think, just planning ahead, having your assignments up early for college professors, really huge support to students so that they have extra time to ask yeah, questions and do those kinds of things. But on the back, there's the Center for Universal Design and Education, the Do It Center. Um, it's very helpful to have a whole section on college um, post-secondary education and UDL. Um, CAST, the Center for Applied um, Special Technology. CAST, they're, the, they're the, the pioneers in universal design for learning. Anything and everything you want to know about UDL is on the CAST website, or there's a link to somewhere else that will have it for you. This actually came from the CAST website. Do it. 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 Uh, but the link to do it came from the CAST website. Okay, um, <laughs> and it all goes back to CAST. <laughs> um, the National Center on Universal Design for Learning has great resources um, for K through six, uh, K twelve and college. Um, a root for every learner is that report that Maryland put out. If you only read one thing, read that report because they pulled a lot of great information from CAST and from the other resources. And it's what you're going to be if you stay in the state of Maryland what you're going to be looking to do. And if you don't stay in the state of Maryland, other states are now making progress and looking to Maryland as a model for what UDL will look like in their state. So, um, and then the periodic table of visualization methods, we don't have time to look at it. Look at that, that one, it, it's fun. Um, it has every kind of visual representation you can imagine from story maps to, um, I learned swimming lane diagrams <laughs> to, all kinds of different wow. types of uh, visual ways to represent information for your students. And it's set up like a periodic chart. So you can see. I, when I saw this, I laughed because in 1990, I was trying to think of the year, as when I was a speech pathologist, I was, on a, I was working with a grant. And I, two days a week, I would go around to school with another special ed teacher, and we did differentiation um, presentations. And the handout that we gave, we actually, um, adjusted the one from Montgomery County and it was called Reasonable Classroom Accommodations. And guess what? It, it was exactly the stuff that was on the Reasonable Classroom Accommodations for, for K-12 teachers back in 1990. 
And at that time, the teachers were saying, we can't do that. That's not fair. We can do that. You know? And so I think this is, these are regular practices now in K-12, pre-K-12 classrooms. But I love that they finally made it to the university level, that it is fair, that it is OK, that it's ways that we can tap knowledge and be better teachers and look at teaching and learning as our goal. And so, um, like I said, if you're, if you're a student, it's like put it in your teacher's mail box, you know, <laughs> anonymously or something like that. So good stuff. But because it's just good teaching techniques. It's not, nothing magical, just good stuff. And so in summation, it's, it's um, and I don't have the, the quotes over there somewhere, but Cass talks about universal design for learning as a way to make instruction better for every student in the classroom. It, it's about making teaching and learning more effective and better. It's not about changing the curriculum. It's about changing the way we approach it and providing students with the opportunity. And all students, not just students with disabilities, everyone so in that classroom. Fixing the teaching, not the kids. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because it, 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 a lot of what's, what kids struggle with is not what they know, it's how we give it to them, and how we ask them to tell us what they know. And so we end with the final empowerment. And this is a. Uh, Poem, I guess, by Goethe, who is a German poet, philosopher, writer. And I've had this on my door in my office for wherever office I've been in for about 20 years. And we used to have one copy, and sometimes I'd go by and somebody would like it and take it, which I thought was great. So now, if you went past my office door, there's like 10 copy um, uh, paper clips. So anybody can take it. But we gave you all a copy, too. and. Um, because it kind of says it all. Um, I've come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element. It is my personal approach that creates the climate. It is my daily mood that makes the weather. I possess tremendous power to make life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis is escalated or de-escalated and a person is humanized or dehumanized. And this is the hardest part right here, but I think the most important part. If we treat people as they are, we make them worse. If we treat people as they ought to be, we help them become what they are capable of becoming. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what we're supposed to do. That's why we're here, to teach. I'm not sure if we find teaching or teaching finds us, but um, that's what we do, and that's how we do it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Anything? Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you so much.